If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Ooh, look, y'all are already standing. God is good. Hallelujah. We'll read verses 1 through 4, and then we'll come back and read uh, the rest of it. Um, and we'll, we'll read about 12 or 13 verses of Scripture today. But if you can get to 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, that's going to be the majority of our reading this morning. Amen? And the Bible says this. We'll read Scripture together. It says, again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. Drave is New Testament for drove. <laughs> Verse 4 it says, And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. While we're standing with heads bowed, we'll just say a quick word of prayer. Father, we thank you for being in this place today, God. We thank you for your presence being in our, pre our presence today, God. We thank you today for what you have done in our lives today, Lord. We thank you for waking us up this morning today. We thank you for health. We thank you for strength today. God, we thank you for our purpose. We thank you for our calling today, God. We just thank you for the shelter that you have given us, Lord. And as we enter into the time where we go into the Word of God, we ask that the Word of God would hit and touch the hearts of those who are here today, causing increase in our lives today, God. God, is no more I, but the Christ that lives within me today, God. We just thank you for your spirit being in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, six paces and then a praise. <laughs> Turn to someone else and say, six paces and then a praise. Paces is J King James for steps. It's, it's King James for steps. Amen. <laughs> How many know that we should praise the name of the Lord? Amen. At all times, we should praise the name of the Lord. And so I just want to share just a couple of things this morning. And so I have a picture for you, and I want to, you to understand where we're coming from this morning. And so this is what's commonly referred in Scripture as the Ark of the Covenant. This is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, I'm on the same page so far. So, so God told the children of Israel back in the Old Testament to make this Ark of the Covenant. And so it was made, the Bible says, out of acacia wood, and then it was covered with gold. And so it was about four feet long. It was about two to three feet wide. And it was, it, was, it, was, it was more like a box. But it symbolized the presence of God. As long as the children of Israel had this Ark of the Covenant in, in their possession, things went well for them. 
And so the Bible says this, and Tarsus spoke on it just a little bit, is that you would have the Ark of the Covenant, and in the Old Testament, you had the outer court and the inner court, and you had the Holy of Holies, and that's where they put the Ark of the Covenant. And what would happen is that one time a year, the priest would go in on the Day of Atonement, and he would kill the blood, and he would sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat. And if you see those two angels on top of the Ark of the Covenant, that, that's just a lid. And so, and so when they would stretch out, and the priest would put the blood of the, of the bull on the Ark of the Covenant, also known as the mercy seat, then the Bible says that God would just come down and commune with his people. The presence of the Lord would come down. And so, and not only did, did the priest slaughter the bull and sprinkle the blood on the top of the Ark of the Covenant and in front of the Ark of the Covenant, but they would also get another animal and they would sla slaughter that and they would sprinkle the blood on the top of the Ark of the Covenant and in front of the Ark of the Covenant for the sins of the people. So one time a year, God covered the priest and his family and he also covered the people and their family. Just making sense. I want to make sure that we're all on the, on the same page. And so the ark was significant in their lives. It represented God. It represented their faith. And there would be times that the, the cloud of God would just descend and they would be able to descend, to see the, the dissension of God in the midst of them. It would give them faith. It would give them comfort. It would let them know that God was on their side. Say, the ark of the covenant. One of the things that we understand from history is the children of Israel would often fight and they would get involved in battles. And there was one time when the children of Israel fought with the Philistines. The Philistines won. And as a part of them winning, they took the Ark of the Covenant and they took it back to Philistia. And so, and, and I, I, I want y'all to read this. Put 1 Samuel chapter 5 up because when I always laugh when I read this because it says, and the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashad. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashad arose early on the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the morning, morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. So, so the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in the same little sanctuary where their God was. And when they came in in the next morning, their God had fallen down in front of the Ark. And they said, oh, no, 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 this can't happen. So they put their God back up and then they left and they came back the next day and their God had fallen before the Ark of the Covenant. And this time his head was cut off, his palms were cut off. Mean, God is saying, I I'm too big for this. He's like, I'm bigger than Dagon, right? And so what happened in the Philistine community is that the next thing you know after that happened, they started having plagues that began to come. Finally, finally they said, this thing, it's got to go. Because cause it's not, it's showing us that it's not welcome here. And so our God has fallen. Uh, the statue of our God's head has been cut off. His palms have been cut off. And so what they said is, please come get the Ark of the Covenant. Because now we got plagues running through the city, and this is just not a good thing. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Say, our God is an awesome God. He's, he's just... He's just an awesome God. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 7, it says, And the men of kirjath Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So they said, please come get it. Please. So, so they sent Eleazar and other people to get it and notice this, they said they had sanctified Eleazar because there was a way that you were to take care of the ark. Is this making sense? 
See, we don't talk about this too much, but in the Old Testament, you didn't go before God's presence without washing yourself as a priest, without cleaning yourself up. You just didn't go to God any kind of way. Y'all want to talk to me? Sometimes, sometimes we think we can just come to God and stay with God any kind of way. Come as you are, but don't stay as you are. So, so God is not only in the blessing business, but he's in the cleaning up business too. Before, if you spend too much time with God, he's going to run you through the washer. Because that's what he does. Is this making sense? So, so they came and they fetched the ark. They took it to Abinadab's house. And Abinadab, actually when we read this in Scripture, he was under uh, the reign of King Saul. And we know that King Saul was king before David. And King Saul and his son Abinadab went to war. And King Saul, the Scripture says, died on Mount Gilboa. And his son also died. And David took over, and David said, we got to go get this ark because I'm king now. And it's only fitting that the ark would be with the king. And by that time, Jerusalem was made the capital city. So he said, we're getting ready to move the ark from Abinadad's house to the temple, which is where we picked up our reading this morning. So put 2 Samuel chapter 6. So, and it says, verse 1, go with me to verse 1 again. It says, again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. So, he's going to get the ark with 30,000 strong because this is a celebration that we're bringing the ark from Abinadad's house back to Jerusalem. And it says this, he arose, it says, and went, uh, being from Baal Judah went with him. It says, to bring up from thence the ark of God, it says, by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. The cherubims were those two angels that were on the top of the covenant, of the ark of the covenant. Verse 3, it says, and they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeon, Uzzah, and Ohio. It says, the sons of Abinadab drave the new cart. Verse 4, it says, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. It says in Ohio, one of the sons of Abinadab was before the ark. In verse 5, you can find it, Jasmine, I know I'm wearing you out. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5. I wanted to read that just so that we're all on the same page. Don't you love technology? It says, and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. So they were 30,000 strong. Abinadab had two sons. The Bible says that Ohio and Uzzah, and they were leading the ark of the covenant away from Abinadab's house back to Jerusalem, and they put it on a cart to transport it. And we'll talk more about that later because they were never supposed to put it on a cart. They were always supposed to carry it. And so now the oxen are going through the threshing floor. They begin to stumble. The ark in the cart begins to shift. Uzzah begins to put his hand up there to steady it, but you weren't supposed to touch it. And then the Bible says that he died right there. Turn to your neighbor and say, there is a way that you approach God. You, you just can't come any kind of way. And this is the thing. So Abinadab had these two boys. They are helping bring this ark out. They both have knowledge of how the ark is supposed to be transported, and yet they put it in a cart anyway. Sometimes as Christians, 
We prefer comfort and convenience as opposed to being correct. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So God can tell us how to do something one way, and we want to skirt around the edges thinking that it will work our way. And so, and sometimes you get away with it, but you never really get away with it. But it does not show up the way that Uzzah showed up in Scripture this morning because he was doing what he thought was a good thing and keeping the ark from sliding off the cart. But God said, you can't touch me like that. He said, I'm holy. There's a way that we are supposed to reverence God. God had already told them, this is the way I want you to carry me. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So, so the Lord had given me just a couple of things. So, so say, carry the ark. See, there is a way that God wants to commune with you. Jasmine, put my next slide up, that, the, the other photo. So, so this is a picture of how the ark should have been transported. So, so the ark was a box, and it had four rings on each corner of the box, and they had these poles that they put in the rings, and you were supposed to carry the ark as a priest on your shoulders. Because God is saying, my presence is supposed to go with you, right? And my presence is supposed to go with you personally, not in a self-made ark. Because sometimes God wants us to feel the pressure of being a Christian. Because sometimes there's pain involved with being a Christian. But our hope, even in the pain, is that God is still directing us because he is looking out for us even for things that we don't even see ourselves. And so God, so think about this. They were carrying the ark, but what they did not realize is that the ark was carrying them. And so God said, this is the way I would want to be transported. You can't just carry me any type of way. Sometimes people want to carry Christ, but they want to carry him in a way that's not befitting to Christ. We want to put him in our trunk until we need him. So we transport him, not in our lives, but we transport him in the back seat or we transport him in the trunk. And then when we need him, we want to open up the trunk, rub him like a genie in a bottle, let him come out, solve all of our problems, and then put him back in the trunk. Oh, y'all don't want to say amen in here this morning. And so there is a way that we are supposed to carry ourselves. Don't you know? that after a while, it would take his toll. But as a Christian carrying Jesus, after a while, it'll take his toll. But you have more faith in who you're carrying than the pain that you're feeling. With, with each step, we know that God is with us. So, because remember, this is the ark that they took across the Red Sea. This is the ark that they took about, took across Jordan. This is the ark. The Bible says when the priest put their foot in the water, it just opened up. So God is with you, but he wants you to carry him a certain kind of way. See, and this is the thing. When you go to your neighbors and you're carrying something like this, they know you're a Christian. But when you go to your neighbors and you, you hide the ark in the cart, they may not know. And God said, I want to be with you. I want you to be with me. But always remember that I'm God. I always remember that I'm God. Do you know some of us even go to God and we got in unforgiveness in our heart? Is it just me? that has ever gone to God with unforgiveness? Think about the holiness of God and the reverence of God and the reverential fear that we should have toward God. That Uzzah, who was doing the right thing, the Bible says God smote him because he said, I don't want you to come to me like that. Sometimes in scriptures, even as a pastor, I think like the consequences and the judgment is more harsh than, because he was trying to do a good thing. It makes you think about Moses, and, and Moses struck the rock when God told him to speak to the rock. And because of that, and because of Moses' anger, he didn't make it to the promised land. You're like, sometimes the, these judgments doesn't seem like it's, it's equal with 
the penalty or, or, the, or the trespass. But sometimes God is trying to show us a bigger picture. How do you carry God? How does God ride with you? Do you dare to lift him up so that everybody can see? Or do you put him in the cart and don't nobody really know who you're trying to transport? Are you a light that's a candle that's put on the heel so everybody can see? Are you an undercover Christian? And I could spend a little time talking about undercover, but I'm just going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that alone right now. That's another sermon for another time, what happens under the cover, but we'll, we'll go on. And God is saying, don't grow too comfortable with me. And then think about David because all this happened on his watch. Uzzah knew, his brother Ahio knew, everybody knew how the ark should be transported, but nobody wanted to say, hey, 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 don't, don't do it like that. Don't, don't do it like that because, you know what, we understand we got like 10 miles to go, so just put it in the cart. And, and think about this, the children of Israel, the priests carried the ark for miles. It was more than 10 miles. So, so, so. Having to say, hey, we just got 10 miles to go, that, I mean, that's not an excuse. Y'all don't want to say amen in here. <laughs> Verse 9 of 2 Samuel chapter 6. I told you if you could find 2 Samuel 6, you'd have it. It says, and David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? He's like, something, something not right. 30,000 strong musical instruments. People are praising. The musicians are playing. And all of a sudden, this guy who's doing the right thing falls dead. And David is like, hold up. Just, just like back in the 70s, you know, when the music was playing and the needle was scratching, you go, Grr. he said, hold up. Don't play another note. Don't take another step. And he said, and, the, and David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? Verse 10, it says, so David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside unto the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. So he said, we're not going to take any more steps. He looked around and he said, we can take it right there. This will be the place for the ark. And then the Bible says this in verse 11, I like this. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So, so they said, hey, we're going to stop right here on the spot. We're going to take it to the house of Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom, will you take it? He said, sure, we'll take the ark of the Lord. Who would not want to take the ark of the Lord? And so because Obed-Edom did right by God, the Bible says all it took was three months and his household was blessed. Not just Obed-Edom, but his entire household. That means his crops were growing. That means his house was looking good. That means his children were acting okay. That means he had joy like he had never had before. That means he had peace that he had never had before. And he had it to such a degree that people from the outside saying, something's going on over at that house because it just multiplying with blessings in three months. God came into his house, he reverenced God, and in three months, he started being bountiful and fruitful, and his house began to overflow. And I love it. I love it that the scripture says it just wasn't him, but it was his household. That God didn't use Obed-Edom to bless his household per se, because, you know, God sometimes can give you some money and then he, he counts on you to, to bless the people. It says, but everyone he came in contact with were blessed on their own. Just by doing what's right with the ark. How are you handling the ark? 
See, Obed-Edom was a Levite too. So when the ark came to his house, he knew how to take care of it. Oh, I'm causing you to think today. He honored God. The honor of God brings blessings into your life. If you would dare to honor him, he would dare to bless you. Is this making sense? And three months is not a long time. If you do what's right by God, by January, things could be different for you. Some people put their head down and say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. We don't know what Obed-Edom's household was like before the ark, but we do know, according to Scripture, what his house was like after the ark. Because God can make a difference. I'm going to say that again because that felt good to my soul. That God can make a difference. Do I have a witness in here that knows that God can make a difference? I'm going to ask it again because I think y'all can do better than that. Do I have a witness in here that God can make a difference? That no matter what you go through, no matter who has come against you, no matter what you have done, if you turn all that around and say, God, it's going to be me and you right now, I'm going to do right by what you have told me to do, it doesn't take as long as you think it would take. In three months, his whole life had turned around just with a little bit of time with God, reverencing God, 90 days, everything was different. Oh, I feel that in my spirit. So, so, so we got to keep going on. So, so the Bible says this, verse 12. It says, and it was told the king, saying, the Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went, he, this is what I love about David because David, he did a lot of things wrong, but when it came time to say like, God, I'm sorry, I'm getting ready to do this thing over, he was the first in line to say like, okay, we need to do what God has asked us to do. So it says, and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God, it says, so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. He was saying, the ark of the covenant actually should be here anyway. And my brother Obed-Edom is benefiting from the fact that I got scared and dropped it at his house to begin with. And now I see all these blessings coming over the walls of his house, and he's like, no, nah, we're going to have to go get that ark. We, we're we're going to have to go get that ark. I don't know if you've ever had, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of giving something away that you didn't think had value, only to realize later on that it did have value. Oh, y'all don't want to y'all don't want to talk to me. So so I don't know, and I know a lot of us are grown now. I know a lot of us are grown now because our teenagers they, they've gone to their class. They know they'll be here first Sunday, but but they're gone now. But I don't know if you've ever dated somebody. And it didn't work out for you. And and your girlfriend came out of respect for you saying, Hey, you know, Johnny was like he called me and 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 I just wanted to find out, are y'all really over? And then you said, oh, yeah, Johnny couldn't do nothing for me. Couldn't do nothing. Couldn't do nothing for me. A and then three months later, <laughs> you see Johnny and your friend, and, and now Johnny got, got his BMW, and, and he, he, got, he got a little, little bling on, and, and you heard that he got a job with benefits. And, and then you think, like, now, wait a minute. Johnny was actually, first of all, Johnny was... Y'all don't want to talk to me. When you didn't think something had value, and you may have given it away too soon, because number one, you didn't understand, or secondly, you didn't want to do right by what you were saying did not have value. That was David's issue, because he was scared on the one hand, and then secondly, he didn't want to take the time to investigate why did this thing not happen for me. When things don't happen for you, you ought to go to God and say, God, what's, what's, what's going on? 
That's good pastoral advice. When things don't go well for me, I go to God and say, God, what's, 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 what's given? What's going on? Because that comes from the mindset that I expect to be blessed. So when I'm not blessed the way I think that I should be blessed, then I go to God and say, hey, what, what gives? Because I know I'm your favorite. Y'all don't want to talk to me. I know the scripture says that I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed coming out and, and I'll be the head and not the tail and, and I'll be above only and not beneath. And when it doesn't go that way, I ask him, what's going on, God, with your boy? What's, what's, what's going on? I thought I was going to get 100% and I only got 85. You know I'm used to 100. You know I'm used to 100. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So when things aren't going well, sometimes you have to have an investigation and a reinvestigation. So David is saying, they're being blessed. I'm getting ready to go get this ark. Girl, I know I said we was, me and Johnny was finished, but I, I changed my mind. I, I, changed, I changed my mind. Turn to, turn to your neighbor and say, it's okay to change your mind. The Bible says this in 1 Chronicles 15. It says, and David made him houses. And let me tell you this. So, so what we read in 2 Samuel 6 is also laid out for us in 1 Chronicles. And I want to help you understand these two different versions. It says, verse, 1 Chronicles 15, 1, it says, and David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. And David said, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God. So David had a reinvestigation of how this ark is actually supposed to be carried, not in the cart. And then he says, and to minister unto him Forever, because when it went into the house of Obed-Edom, after they had dropped it off, it lets you know that Obed-Edom was ministering with the ark. Verse 3, it says, And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. So David found the way. Sometimes it takes a while for us to find Sometimes when bad things happen, it helps us find our way. There's nothing like a little pressure that helps you open up your heart to what God may have told you six months ago or six years ago. And it's so good that God in his infinite wisdom and power and knowledge is able six years later to remind you of what he told you six years earlier. Because if it's that important to him, and that is the reason why things aren't going well for you, then that's what you need to change. Uh-oh. Could it really be that long? Yeah, some of us have done the wrong thing for a long time. And then when things don't go well, we're left with a lot of questions. And questions are great, but questions are just the beginning. Questions take you to God and say, what's happened? And what I like about David is that he had these questions, and at some point in time, he went back to Scripture and realized, we are transporting this ark the wrong way. I've always asked God for this as a pastor, that if I see something that I need to correct, give me the boldness and the courage and the love and the empathy to correct it. Because everyone is standing around the ark on the cart, but no one says like, that's wrong. The only thing about me as a pastor is this, and, and I'm going to give you just some spiritual, I'm going to break you off some spiritual, something spiritual, is that if you don't receive, you may be along here and become a member, but if you don't receive me as a pastor, then you won't receive those are the, the things that I need to tell you. So because 
Everybody might be members, but I'm only shepherding a couple of people because you're the ones who say like, hey, I was thinking about this. I want you to pray with me. Because a lot of times what we get is I've already made this decision, this decision, this decision, this decision. So go ahead and just w and pray with me about it. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll pray with you about it. But I would have liked to have spent some time in prayer like for a month or two months or three months or four months or five months and kind of see what thus saith the Lord. But you already told me, like, no, I've already made this decision. The Lord, Lord told me to quit my job and start my own business. I'm like, okay, then that's what we'll pray, that your business will be successful. I would have liked to have said, like, God, is this what you really want? Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me. See, because everybody's hustle may not be your full-time job. You may be trying to make it your full-time job, but it may not be your full-time job. Is this making sense? Or you may have to work on your hustle just a little bit longer. Before I became a full-time pastor, I worked at it for 25 years. Y'all don't want to talk to me. You're like, oh, no, I couldn't go 25 years without getting paid. Actually, it was closer to 30 where I had the responsibilities of pastoring and teaching and baptizing and baptisms, and, but I didn't get a salary for it. I don't know a lot of people who could work a part-time, full-time job for 30 years and not get paid. Oh, we just need to bow in his presence right now. We just need... <laughs> Because I've had people come to me like as a pastor, like, oh, yeah, you're making money. You've been doing it. I'm like, no, I, I, actually, I only got a salary this year. So I pastored Impact for almost four years without getting a salary. Until our board expressed some wisdom and said, you know what, Pastor Randy, we need to talk. Because if you died today, if we had to get another pastor, they ain't going to come for free. And I'm like, I could have told you that. But I realize as a pastor, sometimes people don't let you in where they could let you in, but they do that for a reason. Is that making sense? See, in 2024, we'll talk about pastors and good pastors and what good pastors look like and what good pastors should do and, and, and how leadership staff should, you know, because, you know, the Bible lays it all out in the book of Timothy and Titus, I mean, what you should be looking for. And so, and sometimes what what the image of a pastor may not be the image that God has for being a pastor. I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that alone. And so the Bible says this, 1 Chronicles 15, let me go to verse 11. It says, and David called for Zadok and Abiathar, the priest, and for the Levites, for Uriel, Asai, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, Aminadab, and said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place. Notice this. So he's calling all of the Levites. He's calling all of the priests. And he says, get yourselves together. Right? Because you can't just touch it any kind of way. And so actually in the Old Testament, the priests were the ones that are actually touched the ark of the covenant. And they would put a cover over it so then the Levites could carry it. So that way the Levites couldn't even look at it. Does this make sense? So verse 12, it says, he said unto them, ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren. Everybody needs to be clean, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. For because ye did not at the first, the Lord God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. So now it begins to make sense with David. So the priest and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with staves or actually rods thereon as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. I'm so glad when people learn without it costing them again. 
David, see, David is still in the process of bringing the ark back. But now he says, we got to do it God's way. So, so the Lord told us this year that every time we come in here, we should give him a praise, which, which means we have to do it God's way. As we go from one place to the next place, God's going to have to do it. The only thing we do is come in with the right frame of mind, a right heart. We've sanctified ourselves, and we give God praise. I wish I wasn't clapping by myself, but we come in and we give God praise. When I look back at the word that the Lord gave me, that was before we started having things that affected us as members. So I looked back and said, God, why? I mean, and then he said, that's why I told you. I knew what was going to happen before you knew. But I want you to keep your hearts right, and I want to keep your spirits right. And he said, I told you in the fourth year to give me praise. And then in the fifth year, you're going to see some great stuff. When you go from one place to the next place, it, become, it happens because you've praised God in your heart. And you said, no matter what happens, I'm going to give you the praise. In good days, I'm going to give you the praise. In bad days, I'm going to give you the praise. When they recognize me on my job, I'm going to give you the praise. When they overlook me on my job, I'm going to give you the praise. When my business is doing well, I'm going to give you the praise. When my business is not doing well, I'm going to give you the praise. When we come in Impact Community Church and there are four to 500 people here, I'm going to give you the praise. After we have a night of worship and we have 200 people here, I'm going to still give you the praise because you're still worthy of the praise. Y'all don't want to talk to me. In unemployment, I give him the praise. and employment, I, I give him the praise. And, and when we get along with our kids, I give him the praise. And when we don't get along with our kids, I still give him the praise. Y'all don't want to talk to me because he's been too good. We give him the sacrifice of praise. Have you ever given God a praise and you said right before you lifted up your hand like, God, I don't, feel, I, don't, I don't feel like praising you today. And he said, girl, you better go ahead. You better go ahead and lift your hands. You better go ahead and open up your mouth. You better go ahead and do your dance. All I'm asking for is that you just treat me right. Isn't that something? Because anybody in any relationship, the only thing they really ask is for you to treat them right. Treat me with the care, the reverence, respect that I think I deserve. When we talk to married couples, one of the needs for every man is to feel this, this word, R-E-S-P-E. If I can be respected by y'all, well, I ain't got no problem. Just, just respect. This is my house. That's my room. Those are all my groceries. The clothes you're wearing, I bought. The car you're driving, I pay for. Bought the insurance on it. And I'm not just talking about my wife. I'm talking about my kids, too. Like, hey, 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 slow your roll. Slow your roll. Slow your roll. Slow your roll. Because you're going to respect me. <laughs> if you don't do nothing else, work too hard. The Bible says this, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 13. It says, and it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. This is David. So they finally got the ark. He's got all of the people again. They're ready. They're sanctified. And the Bible says that they lifted up the ark and they took one, two, three, four, five, six. And then David said, stop, 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 stop. He said, I'm getting ready just to thank God. 
So it says he sacrificed oxen and fatling. So, so, so you, you need to catch this. So it took six steps. And then he said, God has been so good to us because we tried this before and it didn't work. So by the mere fact that we took six steps and we're still alive, that, that means that God is, God is on our side. By, by the mere fact that we had the boldness and the courage to try it again, to go into the house of Obed-Edom and to say, we're getting ready to bring this ark back to Jerusalem, to the place that I've already prepared. And so he couldn't go six steps without thanking God. And, and then notice, if you know David the way I know David, when he took the six steps, it wasn't just because of what God had done that day. He probably went back to when Samuel came to his house and, and, and the daddy David's daddy, Jesse, didn't even have the, the, the awareness of him to even bring him out when Samuel came. So he probably said, thank you, thank you. And, and then when Samuel opened the bottle and poured oil on him and anointed David with a fresh oil, he probably said, thank you. And, and then when he fought the lion and fought the bear and fought Goliath, when no one thought he would win, and he won. He had to say, and when Saul chased him all through the wilderness, all upside the countryside, and he still lived to tell about it. When you read scripture, Saul, all, he tried to kill David over 20 times. He took six steps and couldn't go no further because of what God had done for him. And this is the thing, when I, was, when I was preparing this, I was preparing this, I was kind of looking at some of the commentary, and you know, and I, I love when, when sometimes people that are more educated than myself, the biblical commentaries, they were going back and forth, because the scripture says it took, he took six paces, and then he made a sacrifice. So what some commentary said is that he took every six paces, he had to stop and take a praise break. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So, so on the way from Obed-Edom's house to Jerusalem was about 10 miles. So, so some scholars were saying like, no, that's almost impossible. And then some scholars were saying like, no, 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 we are talking about David. We are talking about David. We are talking about David who had a son, Solomon, that when they dedicated the temple, he just slew over a thousand sheep in one day just to say, God, I thank you. So we are talking about David because when God has done something for you to the degree that nobody else could do it, then no sheep is more important than God, no bull is more important than God, no timetable, no time schedule is more important than God. And David is saying, if we could get this ark back to Jerusalem, I've got all the time in the world. So if I stopped every six paces and said, God, I thank you. Y'all don't want to talk to me. You have been... The next time you're at home and you're praying and you take one, I got one more. I got one more. And when, when that foot comes down for six and you're like, oh, God, I just thought of something else. I just thought of something else that you did. I remember when I couldn't get a car because my credit was so jacked up, nobody wanted to give me a loan. And so, and then when you take another six steps and you're, oh, I, I thought of something else. I thought of something else when I was in a relationship and I never thought I was going to get out of it. And then you take another six steps and then you think of something else. I don't know about you, but every six steps I take, I can praise with every six steps. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And then the Bible says this, verse 14 up there. So, so it, it got so good to David. He said, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. So every six steps, he's like, God, you've been good. And another six steps, he's like, God, you've been so good. And then another six steps, he's like, God, you've been so, so, so good. Until finally, he's like, I, I just, I can't, I can't keep it anymore. So the Bible says that when he danced, he danced with all of his might. 
every ounce, every fiber of his being. He was dancing, praising God for what he had done. Because David could have felt, that happened on my watch, God. I should have told them. Or maybe he thinks, I wasn't even aware. I wasn't aware that when they put the ark in the cart that we should have had it some other kind of way. For every parent in here. And some things, as a parent, some things might just go over your head with regard to your kids, but it still happens on your watch. As parents, we don't know everything. So sometimes your kids could say this, and they, they could tell you three or four sentences, and in that sentence is one word that you should have clued in, and you didn't. And then something happens, and then you feel bad, and you're like, God, I should have caught that. David is saying, God, I, I should have caught that, but I didn't. And so now when we bring it out this time, I'm going to praise you every single step of the way. So he offered seven bulls. He, he offered whatever he had to say, God, I thank you. And then it got so good to him until he just started dancing. Oh, I, oh Lord. People, people were teasing me last night. They're like, you still got some moves. I'm like, oh, yeah. When, when, when God does it, It'll, it'll just make you, oh, y'all. Yeah. Do I have a witness in here that, that when God does something that no one else could do for you, something that you have been praying about for a long time, that you never thought you would get there, and he does it for you? Either you'll dance or you'll bow because you realize it was nobody. Some of us are here today because of God. I didn't measure this. I didn't measure this, but I think from, from your car until this building right now is six steps. I think it's six steps. I, I think. I, does, can everybody, if you are able to stand, can, can, you just, can you just stand? I just want you to take six steps. Just march in place. Just like one, two, three four, five, six. And so we should think about what God has done for us. This is making sense. And he keeps on doing it. Let me tell you this, man, I, I just... Last week, last week, my wife wanted to put a, uh, um, a new doorbell on our house, and it's, it resembles like a ring doorbell, but it wasn't a ring doorbell. And so, uh, me having uh, no skills at all, I had to call an electrician, yes, to put on a ring. I just like, and so when he took it off, it was like two wires, and I'm like, doggone, I could have I done that. And then he said, you don't even have to hook these wires up in the right, it, it'll automatically, I'm like, okay, so I'm paying you $80 an hour to come out here to tell me this. And so, he came out on a Friday and put the doorbell on and left. And Friday evening, we could not get it to work with our apps or anything like that. Because, you know, usually when you have a doorbell, you're able to see it on the phone. So I called him and said, hey, I said, can you come back? Because we can't get it to work. And he said, well, it's Veterans Day weekend. So I won't be back till Monday. I said, cool, cool. So he comes back Monday, and he's like, I think you may have a problem with your doorbell chimes. So I need to go in your attic because I need to trace the, the, the lines and see because I might have to replace everything. And I'm like, ooh, no, no. All I wanted was a little doorbell. So, so, so he goes up in the attic, and he goes by one of our furnaces, and he's like, I think I smell gas. I'm like, I think I smell gas too. And so then he's like, yeah, so I smell gas. <laughs> and I'm like, uh-oh, I need to be getting my stuff too. He comes down, he's like, you need to call a plumber, and you're probably going to need to call ONG. 
I called ONG, and I was on the phone. I was like, yes, I smell gas. The lady was on the phone, and she's like, okay, you don't need to call me from a cell phone. If your garages are up, you don't need to let your garages down. You don't need to turn on any lights in the house. You don't need to do it. I'm like, wait a minute. What, what's, what's going on? I told Tarsha, like, we might have to get ready to leave. But then I said, if we leave, then when the plumber comes, who's going to... I called like 10 different plumbers. Nobody could get us in that day. Finally called one and said, I could come out today. Well, let me go back to ONG. ONG goes up in the attic and they can't find the gas smell anymore. But then they come out to the gas meter and they hook it up. And he's like, oh, yeah, you, you, got, you got a leak. Because I turned off all of the gas in your house and the meter is still spinning. So, so he's like, he unhooks it, takes like the gas meter out, and he's like, yeah, you need to call a plumber. I'm like, wait a minute, you can't leave us with no gas. Where are you going? So then I call a plumber. I got one that comes out, and now they got to put air in the line to trace it because there's no gas in the line anymore, and they found the leak. We had no idea we had a leak. Tarsha thought she had smelled gas like two weeks earlier, but we didn't smell it anymore. So we thought, so, so, so the plumber comes out, he fixes the leak, we call ONG, they turn our gas back on, and I took six steps. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Because they were in the attic. So before I could let the attic door up and get into the garage, get from the garage into the house, I took six steps and I'm like, God, you have done it again. Because people are like, you need to leave. You need to leave your house. You need to get out. You need to do this. And I'm like, ooh, God. So, so now let me show you my learning experience. My learning experience is that for the plumber and the people who came out, I'm involved in a maintenance contract now. I'm, I have a maintenance contract. They come out every change of seasons now. Because when you know better, <laughs> when David knew better, did better. Today, I want you, when you take six steps, just think about this word. When you go into your office, and from your car to your desk, it's going to be six steps. And you should say, God, I thank you. I thank you. That nobody could do it like him. And this is the beautiful thing about God, is that he does things that we don't even know He's doing. For making a way out of no way for us. For keeping us this year. When tragedy struck, we still maintained our sanity through it all. Yeah, we had some sleepless nights because we felt the pressure of what it's like to still be a Christian when you feel pressure. But God still made a way for us. He helped some of us to be better friends this year. He helped some of us to be better spouses this year. He helped some of us to be better parents this year. Every six steps, you have something to thank God for. Going into this week, don't let this just be a regular Thanksgiving meal. So, so where somebody may say a prayer, no, 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 we're all going to gather around the table. We're going we're gonna to go old school. We're going to grab each other's hands, right? And, and, for, and for the missing person that should have been there, that's not there, we're still going to thank God for that chair and for that person. And we're just going to tell God, God, I thank you. That, that whether I have turkey, whether I have a ham, whether I have a Cornish hen, whether I have one of those little tubes of bologna, or from my people who look like me, bologna, I'm going to thank God. I'm going to thank God. Whether I bought my Thanksgiving meal or whether someone provided a Thanksgiving meal for me, 
right? Because that's what our church has done, right? Last week and going into this week, we're going to still thank God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you ought to thank God for the things he has done. When you thought you were alone and he showed up to say like, no, 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 you're not alone. You're never alone. I have always been with you. I will always be with you. You can't get rid of me. This is the God that we serve. When you were scared and didn't know how you were going to make it and you were fearful and didn't know how it was going to turn out and God showed up. The Bible says with his right arm of power, he, he showed up for you. And he just doesn't do it once. He does it over and 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 he just keeps doing it over and over and over and over and over again that's that's the type of god that that we serve who wouldn't serve a god like this i'm gonna leave you with this scripture put psalms chapter 119 on the screen This is what David said. He said, seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Six paces, he gave him a praise, and then he said, I'm going to do one better. Seven times a day. See, see, this comes from a man who had to sleep in caves. This comes from a man who married a woman from his father-in-law and then he took her back and said like, no, it ain't, no, I changed my mind. This, this comes from a man who was involved with a father-in-law and then the father-in-law threw a spear at him. And this is the same one that then would come in and play music and the evil spirits would leave. When he looked back over his life and he didn't have a cell phone to set a reminder but he couldn't go too far in the day without thinking about what God had done. And he said, seven times a day. Old folks say, if I had 10,000 tongues, it wouldn't be enough. If I had 10,000 hands, it wouldn't be enough to lift you. Everything, this is prophetic, everything doesn't have to look right for it to be right. I don't know who that's for this morning, but it doesn't have to look right for it to be right because God still may be working some things out that you may not even be aware of. God knows how to fix things on the other side even before you get to where you're going. You think it's going to be one way, but it's not going to be that way because by the time you get there, God already has worked it out. One day, we will go from worshiping God to being a worshiper of God. One day, we'll go from just coming into a building, lifting our hands to worship, to that's just what we do. That's, that's what we do. That's, that's just, that's who we are. The Bible says that God is looking for people to worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's what I do. That's, that's what we do. Every six steps, every six steps, I challenge you, every six steps, something ought to come out of your mouth of what God can and will do in your life. He 
it's what I do. If you've had to praise him through pain this year, then you know what I'm talking about. Praise is what I do. If you had to praise him through pressure this year, and you still manage to carry the ark of God high in your life, there is a reward on the other side. Your house will be like the house of Obed-Edom. Here's what I do. Lift your hands in here. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We really appreciate you supporting our broadcast. And if you've never had an opportunity to join us in person, if you're in the Oklahoma City area, we want to invite you to Impact Community Church. We're located at 4400 Northwest Expressway in the Cole Community Center. We have something for everybody in your family. Bring your kids, bring the entire family. I know they will love Impact. If you would like to sow into Impact Community Church, you can give on our website by mail or text to give. The information is on the screen. Thank you for your support.